I'd like to uh, express my appreciation again uh, to uh, the jurors who are here. And I want to introduce myself and uh, the organization that I represent as part of an effort to explain uh, the significance of these grand jury's proceedings. It's been stated, my name is Omalia Shetela. I am the chair of the African People's Socialist Party, which is an organization of an international party called the African Socialist International that exists in Africa, in East Africa, West Africa, South Africa at this moment, exists in the Caribbean, where a, attorney uh, Alex Morley uh, has come here from immediately, exists uh, throughout Europe, in Belgium, in France, in Germany, in England, uh, in Norway, and Sweden, and exists uh, in Canada and throughout the United States. And the African People's Socialist Party is the parent organization of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, NPDM, uh, that has called together this grand jury. But I want to say that it is not something that we could have done without uh, participation from Zaki Buruti. And uh, Zaki Buruti is the, the leader of the Universal African People's Organization. It is a name uh, with significance for us who are in this meeting, because clearly it is a name that is associated with the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, an organization that was founded by Marcus Garvey and the slogan of which was, Africa for Africans, those at home and those abroad. And what makes that significance is that it was an organization that clearly recognized that the oppression that black people experienced all over the world had to do with the fact that we were dominated by other folk and did not have control of our own affairs, our own institutions, our own governments, so to speak, which is one of the reasons I believe it was easy for Brother Zaki Baruti and the Universal African People's Organization to unite with the notion of having a black people's grand jury, because it speaks to our recognition of the need for our people to take control of our affairs, to assume responsibility for our condition in the world. And that's what this Black People's Grand Jury is all about. Brothers and sisters, as you know from your own experiences here in St. Louis County and as someone able to see what's happening throughout the world. The matter that we are discussing on today around Darren Wilson, the, the public execution of Mike Brown is something that is bigger than St. Louis, bigger than Ferguson, that it speaks to the conditions that we experience in this country and in this world today. It's not good enough just to come here and pretend that there is no context for what happened to Mike Brown. It's not good enough to come here and pretend that we are not accustomed to white men killing black people and going free for having done that. We've seen that historically. We saw that with Emmett Till, didn't we? We saw that uh, since then with the four children who were killed in Birmingham, haven't we? So we're not looking at something new. It's historic. But it's really important for us in this meeting, this session, to understand something about what it is that we are dealing with. 
Everybody is in motion throughout this country. Everybody is concerned. 12 year old children being shot down. In Detroit, seven year old Ayana being killed by police in her bed. This is something that's happening throughout this country and it will not serve us to simply come here and talk about how the police need more training. They don't understand. There needs to be more black police. They need to have, have body cameras and that kind of thing. That doesn't get to the essential question. It might get to the essential question if Ferguson was the only place we are looking at the problem. But it's something that we're looking at throughout the country, in Cleveland, Ohio, in St. Petersburg, Florida, in Houston, and Dallas, Texas. Everywhere you look, we are facing this situation. So clearly, it's bigger than training, that something else is going on. And guess what? It didn't start on August 9th of 2014. So it seems that when we talk about this process, what we've been clear about is one of the things we want to do is indict the grand jury process. I think we've, we've done that relatively well up to now. We've used the same basic evidence, and you will have an opportunity to sit down and discuss this and come up with some kinds of determination. But we see that there's something corrupt and tainted about the entire process of the grand jury, where a prosecutor says, I put some liars on the grand jury and let them testify over a matter of days. But I still accept the conclusion that they've come to based in part on lies that allowed me to dismiss credible testimony and evidence that's come from people in our own community and from people who, one person who was actually with Mike Brown when he was murdered. But I think it's important for us to understand that even though we can point and we should point to Robert McCullough and what he did, it doesn't explain what happened with Eric Garner. He wasn't the prosecutor there where a grand jury came and said despite video evidence of him being choked to death, but he wasn't just choked to death, you saw that on video. Humiliating, horrible treatment. How they pushed his head, tried to push his head through the sidewall. But McCullough can't be blamed for that, he wasn't there. So something else is happening here. We look around this country and see cities like Philadelphia, Philadelphia, I remember when it had a black mayor and a black chief of police and they dropped a bomb on a black community killing, 60, killing 11 women, children and men, destroying 60 some odd blocks and a black mayor who said, yes, I did it and I'd do it again. So it clearly is not just about the fact that Ferguson had a lot of white cops and a lot of white city council persons, <coughs> which is not to say that that shouldn't, that should be disregarded. We should recognize that, but clearly that's not the only issue that we're dealing with. So I think it's really important as we have this discussion and come to some conclusions about this matter of Darren Wilson willfully killing, murdering Mike Brown in Ferguson on August 9th, something else is at work, and I just want to speak to that briefly. You know, we had someone who testified on yesterday, and he gave his opinion that we can't do without the police, he said. He said, if there were no police, there would be anarchy and et cetera. Well, he didn't produce any evidence of that. Uh, and in fact, I believe he'd be hard pressed to show any case where the police has solved the problem in my community. I can't think of one. It never brought the television back that got stolen. <laughs> and 
the mother who called the police because her son went off his medication ended up with a dead son, right, by police. I've never seen them solve a problem. I've seen problems originate because of their presence, but I can't think of any time where they've solved problems. But beyond that, where do police come from? They're not just in Ferguson. They're in France. They're in Africa. They're in the Caribbean. You should see how they treat black people in the Caribbean. They have this thing that they call, what's that shuffle? The what? Bike lane shuffle. The, the bike lane shuffle. They just have Africans, because he's, he's coming from Nassau, which is a tourist center. White people go down there to enjoy themselves all the time. They call it independence. They just put some black people in charge of controlling a situation where white people still own all of the, everything that's in there. And so part of the tourist attraction has been this thing they call the bike lane shuffle. There's this area called bike lane where they move African people from the courthouse to the jail or back and forth who are in chains. And all the white tourists are able to gawk at these chained men <coughs> shuffling the bike lane shuffle. That's a black government, they say. What is going on? Police are everywhere, prisons, courts. But where do they come from? They emerge just because of everybody being chaotic, bringing chaos to the world? No. There is an origin of the police. They come from a particular place. Anytime society is divided, <laughs> it's split between haves and have-nots. And most societies have been split for a long time between those who have and those who don't have. And those who do have, for the most part, get what they got from those who don't have. Which is why you have in this country, as an example, the people who worked hardest to build the economy and everything here, black people, right, got nothing. Those who have are the ones who work least. Those who have are the ones who work least. The ones that work most hardest produce all the value that's here. On somebody else's land have nothing. It's when you have this kind of situation that it is necessary for some force to be created and presides over that society to maintain order. Because if you didn't have that happening, what is it <coughs> to keep the person standing in front of a quick trip with a styrofoam cup in his hand, begging, what is it to keep that person from walking in the store and filling up the basket and get everything that that person needs to eat? It is this thing that they call the police. But the police is something that comes from an organization called the state. The state is an organization of coercion, of oppression, something that you must have if you have a relationship between the haves and the have-nots. What is it that keeps a sick person from simply running down to the hospital and hopping into an empty bed. If that person has no money or no insurance, uh, they've been tricked by what the thing they call Obamacare. You don't go to a hospital because you're sick. You go to a hospital because you got money or insurance. If you got, don't have money or insurance, it doesn't matter how sick you are. You go to the hospital, then the state intervenes if you're there improperly. The police is called, and it takes you away. Might even be Darren Wilson shows up, and it takes you away. And it takes you and puts you before another institution of the state that's called the court. 
And if the offense was serious enough, there's another institution of the state <coughs> that they might involve that they call the grand jury. The point is that these organizations of coercion are entities of the state, something that comes into existence when society is split down the lines of haves and have-nots. You can't have peace other than that. You just can't steal from people, take all their resources without having some kind of organization to maintain the order. What is it to keep somebody from coming through your window at night to take back everything that you've stolen? What is it that keeps somebody who can go to the internet or go to a television and see all the wealth created, concentrated wealth? I don't mean it just came, was created today. I'm talking about value is concentrated from yesterday in what you see today. The cotton that was picked in Mississippi or Arkansas yesterday is concentrated, the value is concentrated in the iPad that you have today. What is it that sees somebody who's responsible for creating that wealth? What is it that stops that person from coming in the window late at night to take him back? Even if they don't recognize where it came from. It's the state. Darren Wilson was an instrument of state power. Robert McCullough was an instrument of state power. The state, the purpose of the state is to maintain the status quo and protect the interests of those who are in power. That's what the state is for. That's what it's always for. If the police kills in our community, it's not an accident. That's what the state does. And in America, America is different. The state was organized in places like France and Germany, throughout Europe. Even though there are contradictions in how it came into existence, America is different in this regard. America, like Australia, like Canada, America is a place where foreigners came and took the land from the people who were indigenous to this land. And there were millions of them that have been disappeared, near genocide committed against them. And the survivors are mostly in concentration camps that they call Indian reservations. Half of Mexico <coughs> was stolen. And they drew an artificial border there that said, this is now America. They called this part of Mexico, California, Texas, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, etc. And they have a special organization that has been designed to deal with that group of people. And then, of course, there was African people, where the continent of Africa came under assault. You know that's why we're here. I know Brother Zaki understand that's why we're here. We're not in this country because 400, 500 years ago, somebody said, look, we know one day they're going to create the NFL. Let's get a jump on them and get there early. Be first in line. It didn't happen that way. Africa was attacked. The whole continent of Africa was transformed. 12 million square miles transformed into a place for breeding human beings who would be enslaved, both in Africa and throughout various other places around the world. This is what the wealth that we look at today, this is its origin. This speaks to how the state was forged in America as even different from Europe. Because in America, <laughs> the state <coughs> is forged 
by groups of people who organized to kill and control what they call Indians. The Texas Rangers was a group of individuals. They weren't even government. They were a group of individuals in the beginning. You heard of the one who runs around with the guy called Tonto, which in Spanish means stupid? So uh, the Texas Rangers was one of the part of the process controlling the Mexicans, keeping Mexican land, Indians. This is how the state emerges in this country. Slave catchers who had a responsibility for capturing and controlling African people. This is what gives shape and definition to the state in this country. It has always had African people in its crosshairs. It has always had what they call Indians in the crosshairs, which is why even today, their own what they call Indian reservations have lost all their land and have a lifespan that in the, in the 40s. Bob McCullough didn't do that. It was institutionalized. And this entity called the state is responsible. And what is the state? It is an organ of coercion, a force that employs prisons, courts, that employs armies, police, and the rest of it to protect the status quo, to keep the slaves from taking back what belongs to them, to keep the Indians from rising up. That's why we live in a country today. These brothers here are lawyers. And even though it's not necessarily a matter of law, it is a saying that's used to signify law in this country when they say 99, what do they say, possession is 99%, nine-tenths of the law, something to that effect. Possession, not how you got it, you understand, but possession. If I got it, nine to the law says mine, you understand? And that's the kind of law that's created by thieves. So if a thief creates the law, then thievery is legal. You see, I just think it's really important for us to understand this question of the state and organization. It is the vehicle through which the ruling class demands a monopoly on violence. The ruling class demands a monopoly on violence. That's why, even if you look at what happened here, they had more than 100 FBI agents in, in this area. I don't know how many there are now, probably in the room. But in more than 100 FBI agents here, I said, well, maybe that means something because I've been reading the newspapers and if the FBI is here to start to bring some peace and stability, they must be concerned about this brother, Mike Brown, just having been killed by a guy named Darren Wilson and now everybody on the police force wearing braces saying, I am Darren Wilson. I know that's where the FBI, that's the first stop, I would assume. And if not there, Certainly, it seems to me, the FBI would be investigating the fact that here in St. Louis County, after Mike Brown was killed and the people started demonstrating, white people bought up all the damn guns here. So I know the FBI must be going to investigate all these white people who are buying guns with the backdrop of a black person being murdered. So if all the white, what are they going to do? Kill some more? One would think that's what the FBI would do if, in fact, it was interested in peace. One would think the FBI would be concerned about the fact that white people gave this man at least a million dollars reward. Surely the FBI is going to do investigating that, but I didn't see that happen. What I saw was the FBI did a sting and arrested three people who were in the new Black Panther Party who was protesting what, 
happened to Mike Brown and what was happening to black people here? You know why? Because Eric Holder and the FBI are a part of the state. And in our case, the state has a particular look because black people and so-called Indians and Mexicans are oppressed as a people. We are colonized people. And colonialism works and looks the same way wherever it is. Darren Wilson isn't the only one who makes mistakes. Read your newspaper and see the last time they made a mistake in Afghanistan by bombing a wedding or a funeral or something like that where they occupy. Because colonialism is colonialism and we are colonized and the state is an institution of oppression. And when you are not just someone who is exploited, but you are exploited as the other. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are the other, which is why they can kill us with impunity and they can say, oh no, it doesn't bother me at all. They can do an interview and say, I would do the same thing all over again because it wasn't his brother, his sister, somebody that he identifies as a part of him, but it was the other. And the other is the problem. And we are the other. And it's important for us to understand that. We are not fighting against the feelings that white people have about us talking about racism. We are fighting against colonialism. The power that white people have over us. The power. And that power is reflected in the state. So if we won't change, then what we have to do is move the white people's state out of our lives and create a state power of our own. That's why we have a black people's grand jury. It is the beginning of the process of seizing state power over our own black lives. I think it's really important for us to understand this. We have a really important mission here on today. It's a historic mission. It's not just running around and demonstrating. I believe in demonstration. I've spent my life demonstrating and going to jail for demonstrating and doing things like that. But it has to go beyond simply demonstrating what is the mission. Demonstrating toward what end is the question that we have to answer. So everybody's demonstrating. But this meeting on today has historic significance because it points the direction toward our responsibility to achieve state power. Our responsibility to achieve state power. I didn't say our right, which is a legal, def legal term. I say our responsibility. And it's our responsibility whether it is legal or not. In the viewpoint of the ruling class, it's our responsibility. Because Nat Turner, you heard of Nat Turner. What did he do? He led a slave uprising under the slogan, strike at night and spare no one. Nat Turner led a slave uprising and they captured Nat Turner. And after they captured Nat Turner, they brought him and they put him on trial for escaping slavery. You heard what I just said? Because slavery was legal. And then the judge said, I find you guilty. Nat Turner said, I don't feel guilty. I don't feel guilty. And so we are simply following the trail that people like Nat Turner blazed before us. Doesn't matter. The slave master makes laws to protect slavery. Who ever heard of a slave master making a law to protect the slave? That's crazy. The slave master makes the law to protect slavery. It is the responsibility of the slave to rise up and protect himself. Black people's grand jury is the way forward. Uhuru.